Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. What an awesome time of worship today. You know, we don't have to get into the traditional worship and just sing songs, which is sweet. Nothing wrong with singing songs. That's a blessing to the Lord's ear. But how awesome is it that we can just get together and pray with our voices and with our hearts to offer up an attitude of gratitude, thankful hearts for everything that the Lord has done for us. So, praise God. Uh, John chapter 3, let's pick up here in in verse 22. We're going to just continue where we left off in our verse-by-verse study. Beginning in verse 22, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was baptizing in Ainan, near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answers and says, A man can receive nothing unless it was given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, and I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is earthly and and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who received his testimony has certified that God is true, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you so much, Lord for being a living God and a living word. And we pray, Lord, that as we enter into this scripture, into this text today, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that you would uncover blind eyes. Lord, that you would transform us into what you've created us to be. We thank you, Father, that that you're faithful to to complete the work that you've, you've started in us. And we pray, Lord, that you would just Just take your hand and just begin to chisel even now. Shaping us, transforming us, molding us. Lord, I pray that that our hearts would be soft like clay. And that we would allow you to do this work in us. Father, I pray that each of us would receive your testimony now. That we would would not reject the words that you're about to speak to us. We thank you, God. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We surrender this this time to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sweet stuff here. After these things, it says, Jesus and his disciples, they had gone out into the land of Judea, and it was there that they were baptizing. Now, we're told that John also was baptizing, and John had gone out to the place of, Ainan. It looks like Ainan, but it's Ainan, near Salem. And why did he go there? Because there was much water there. It says that they had come to him and were baptized because John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, as I was reading this uh, this week, I was kind of meditating on the word, and I was asking myself, well, why did John go to this place? How did he come about uh, Ainan? Why go to Ainan? 
And it was very simple. There was much water there. Ainin, the actual word, means springs. There were many springs in this place, so John the Baptist simply went out there and started baptizing people. And I was thinking about this because at times, when in our Christian walks, we begin to desire to be in the will of God. We desire to be in God's will, to do God's will. But at times, I think we begin to make it a little bit too mystical. We make the will of God mystical. And I think that God is seeking to demystify it in our hearts. It, it, it's, God's will is simple. Yeah. His will is very simple. Now, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says this. Colossians 3, 15. It says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Interesting. Be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. We know that in the original language, the word for rule is the same word that we get the word umpire in our athletic events. So as you go to a baseball game and the umpire says, that's a foul ball, or that's a strike, or this ball's in play, that ball's not in play. Umpiring. Well, the scripture says to allow the peace of God to umpire in your heart, leading you in which direction to go. And that's just such a, it's a sweet test that we can apply to our lives. If you've been born again of God's Holy Spirit, you've embraced Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and inside your life, you know, only you know yourself. None of us can judge you. I can't judge you. Only the Lord knows your heart. But if you know that you're, you are seeking the Lord with all of your heart, that he's a center point of your life, then you can trust that when the Lord says in Hebrews 8.10, he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, that I will put my laws in their mind and write them on the tablet of their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. If you've surrendered your heart to the Lord, what the Lord will do is he'll begin to implant desires into your heart. He'll implant his law into your heart. If he's number one, if he's the priority. So why do I share this with you? What's on your heart? What do you want to do when it comes to God's will? Sometimes it's that simple. Hey, John went to this place. He didn't wait upon a vision. He didn't wait for the miraculous to happen or some type of spiritual sign to lead him to this place. He simply went because he wanted to, because there was much water there. Hey, it'd be easy. There's a bunch of springs. I can go baptize people over there. It's that simple. And sometimes in our, in our Christian walk, we begin to stay stagnant and we don't move forward because we uh, tend to think we need some type of great sign. Well, God simply says, hey, if you're serving me with all of your heart, with all your mind, with everything, then I'm going to plant my desires on you. What do you want to do? Do you want to be a mission, missionary in Africa? Well, go be a missionary in Africa. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you, do you want to go to church tonight? Go to church. Maybe sometimes we say, Lord, I want to go preach the gospel, but you need to show me who to, who to preach the gospel to. Send me a sign. Speak to me in a dream. Tell me the person's name. And there we wait for the rest of our lives, waiting for God to send some type of miraculous sign. Indeed, he does do that sometimes. God does do the miraculous to get us moving sometimes. But indeed, there's, there's those moments where we can just trust in what the Lord has said. Go ye into all the world. Make disciples. Baptize them. Lead them to me. Lead them to the cross. You simply go. You don't have to wait for a sign. What's on your heart? Go for it. It's so radical because I shared a testimony with some guys this morning about a little conflict I was having. And I was reminded of a verse in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 21 and 22. And it says, bind them, speaking of the words of God, bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. And when you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak to you. Bind the word of God around your neck. 
Hold fast to them. They'll keep you. They'll lead you. They'll speak to you. If you want to know the will of God, read his word. Trust his word. And as you've placed your trust in him, and now the desire is on your heart, just go. Go for it. And if you start to see flags and now you find yourself striving, that's when you might need to sit back and, and ask some questions. Because not only do we have that verse in Colossians 3.15 that states to let the peace of God rule in your hearts, let the peace of God umpire in your hearts, but the verse following, verse 16, tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, we're reminded of a guy named Jonah. Jonah was given a word from the Lord, didn't he? He had one. Go to Nineveh. What did Jonah do? He didn't go to Nineveh. He went the opposite direction, and he found himself a little boat, and he's like, wow, that boat, it's right there. It's waiting for me. There's a sign. Let's follow a sign. There's the boat. Let's get on the boat. And, and then he gets on the boat, and, and we know that the storms are raging, and all the people were freaked out. But what was Jonah doing? He was sleeping. This guy's sleeping. They had to go wake him up and like, dude, what's the problem? you you got to be the problem. Now, there's those times when maybe we have peace, but we're acting against the Word of God. So know that, that, that peace goes hand in hand with the Word. Yeah. The peace goes hand in hand with the Word. Does that thing that you're seeking to do in your heart, that's been on your mind, is it in agreement with the Word of God? Do you have peace? Well, those are the qualifications. If you do, go for it, my friend. Don't stand around any longer. Go for it. Whatever God's put on your heart, go for it. Now, it's interesting that this city, Anan, the place of springs, is near Salem. It's near peace. Salem means peace in the original language. And whenever you're in the will of God, whenever you're in Ainan, you will always be near Salem. The peace of God will just trail you and follow you and encompass around you. So that's where John the Baptist is. He's here in Ainan, near Salem, baptizing. And it's incredible because in verse 25, it says that then there rose a dispute among John's disciples and the Jews about purification. John, what are you doing out there baptizing Jews? Because in those days, they only baptized the Gentiles who were converting to Judaism. So why are you baptizing Jews? And there arose a dispute among the disciples of John and the Jews. But the disciples then come to John and they notice something. They say, Rabbi, hey, you know that one that was with you beyond the Jordan, Jesus, to whom you have testified? Behold, Jesus, he's baptizing and all the people are going to him. What's going on here? Here, John the Baptist is resting in the will of God, in the simple will of God. He's out there baptizing. Make straight the way of the Lord. Then arises these disciples who are missing the point. John, all the people are going to Jesus now. What are you going to do? They're all getting attracted to Jesus. They're going to him. What are you going to do? Competition with Jesus? Oh, man, let us never be in, in competition with Jesus. He's taking your disciples. They're all going to him. He's got more than you. At this point, we know that John's disciples, they were simply missing the point. But let's take a look at what John's response was there in verse 27. He says, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. A man can receive nothing unless it was given to him from heaven. That is a good response. That is something that should be in the heart of each and every one of us. That We're not in competition with one another. Ministry leaders, servants of the Lord God, we're to never be in competition with one another because man can do nothing unless it has been given to us from heaven. Now it's pretty radical here because we see the heart of John the Baptist. Do you want to be like David who said he's a, a man after God's own heart, the word tells us? Do you want to be that man? Well, check it out here from John's mouth. 
The Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's saying, hey, dude, I can't, I'm a nobody. Yeah. Trying to tell everybody about a somebody who can save anybody. I'm just, yes. I'm a nothing. Yeah. Apart from God, I, I have nothing. I'm not here to compete with Jesus. I'm not to, here to compete with his mission. I'm here for the completion. My eye is on the end goal. He says, I am, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the path, the, make straight the way of the Lord. Yeah. He said that, that there's one coming in whom I'm not worthy to even loose his sandal strap. His heart was in the rightful position. Man, it has nothing to do with me. Remember, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He says, if you abide in me, if anyone abides in me and I in him. Wow, incredible stuff. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about it. If I have a, a tree in my backyard, an orange tree, and I was to rip one of the branches off of it, and to go and... And, and stick it back there with the office cat. The office cat might enjoy that branch for a little bit, but guess what? There ain't going to be any orange juice for that cat. There's going to be no fruit, no oranges for that cat to, to love on. Guess why? Because that branch has been, been torn away from the tree. And Jesus says, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. I wonder why we read these verses in the scripture in which Paul starts to say stuff like, um, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And he goes on in Philippians 4.13 and he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because he recognized, man, it's not me. The sufficiency for godly living is only found in him. So how does that pertain to us? Well, I believe it's pride prevention. You guys want a little pride prevention? Yeah. Let it ring in your hearts and mind that a man can do nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So any abilities we have, any gifts that we have, any ministry that we possess, know this, that it is a, a direct gift from heaven. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Think about this, guys. If there's anything that you excel in, anything at all, anything that you're good at, know this, that it's solely because of the sovereignly and graciously Lord God Almighty who has given you these desires, these abilities. Anything that you possess has been given to you from God. Any good thing, apart from Him, you can do nothing. Why am I stressing this point? I believe it's because there are times in our lives when we try to live the Christian life based on our own self-discipline, based on our own human effort. And when we do this, we're setting ourselves up for failure because we begin to draw upon our own resources. But guess what, guys? Our resources are bankrupt. Our resources are empty. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. It is only through God Almighty. John the Baptist saw this. Hey, I'm out here baptizing. People are repenting. Some are coming. Some are following Jesus, but it is only because of Him. It has nothing to do with me. I read this quote recently. Check this out. It says, Man is not sufficient of himself. Man of himself does not have the adequate resource for anything of eternal value. Of his own means, he can not live as godly. He cannot save souls. He cannot transform lives. The sufficiency to accomplish anything of godly value is from God alone. And you know what that does, guys, is it gives me peace in my heart. Because now I no longer have to I no longer have to strive in my own efforts, but I can simply abide in Him, to abide in His Word, and He will abide in me, and He will be my strength, and I will know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Man, that was the heart of John the Baptist, and there he is in verse 28, in chapter 3, he says, You yourselves bear witness that I said, 
I'm not the Christ. Did you guys forget? We had this conversation already. I, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. I'm not the Christ. What a radical confession to realize that we have no strength and, and no power in ourselves. We're nobodies. We're not the Christ. I've been sent before him. And he, and he gives us now a cultural analogy of this day. A cultural analogy he says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. What would happen here in those days, there was a wedding custom. And it was the best man's job, the best man of the groom. The best man was, was in charge of inviting people to the wedding and, and, and setting up the invitations. And we looked at Mary's role as we looked at the wedding feast there in Canaan. Cana. Canaan or Cana? I don't know. Anyhow, there's a wedding feast over there in uh, John chapter 2. Now we're here in chapter 3, and John the Baptist is giving us an illustration, uh, an analogy. And he says, hey, the, the, the best man, his job was to kind of invite and get the people to come. And his job was to kind of uh, prepare the bride for the groom. And what would happen is he would make these preparations and there was the, that moment at, at, at some certain point in the wedding feast where the best man would then take the, take the groom and lead him to the, to the bride or lead the bride to the groom and, and they would there be inside the wedding chambers. And the, the groom would then speak out a word to the best man kind of like a little signal call that everything was all right. Man, you did a good job. You prepared the room. You prepared the bride. You did your job well. Thank you. And he would announce this from the, in, from the inner chambers of the bridal suite. And the, the best man at that point, inside of his heart, when he heard the voice of the bridegroom, his heart would then rejoice and there would be a satisfaction like, wow. The groom is well pleased. The groom is well pleased. That's my joy. And here John is. He's saying, man, I'm just the best man. I'm just the best man preparing, preparing the, the way of the Lord. Yeah. Inviting the people. Man, get ready. He's coming. Yeah. This wedding's coming. The groom's going to marry the bride. Yeah. Just in preparation, John prepares the way, prepares the hearts of the people. as He says, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And now, he says, just to hear the voice of the groom fulfills my joy to say, well done. You prepared the way. You did your part. That was his joy. I'm not the Christ. I'm a nobody. I'm just doing what he's called me to do. And to hear his voice, man, that excites me. The best man's joy fulfilled. Notice that this comes at the peak of John the Baptist's ministry. John the Baptist is just cruising around for a while. Now, every, man, people are flocking him to come out. And there's that guy eating grasshoppers and wearing camel's hair out in the middle of the wilderness. Let's go get baptized. Even, he's stirring up, stirring up stuff even among the, the Jews and the Sanhedrin. They're sending people out to find out who he is. This is the peak of his ministry. And at the peak of his ministry, J the B, John the Baptist, did not lose sight. Thank you. Thank you. J the B didn't lose sight. Of, of what was most important. It was Jesus. Just simply driving people to Jesus. He was the reason for everything. So I ask you guys, do you want your joy, as John the Baptist, do you want your joy to be fulfilled? Do you want your joy to be fulfilled? And I'm here to encourage you to tell you that your joy being fulfilled is not in receiving something from the Lord, or not in doing something for the Lord, but simply in hearing the voice of the Lord. Simply in, in hearing His voice. Because guess what? When you hear Him speak those words, and He tells us to, to build our house on the rock. Build your house on the rock, for when the waves come and the storms come and the winds blow, that house, it didn't fall. But build your house on the sand. He who builds his house on the sand is a fool. 
because he doesn't have that firm foundation. Man, when his voice speaks to us and, 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 and we, we build our faith on him solely based on who he is, that is a firm foundation and our joy will be made full, unshakable. Sometimes we think that if we have a, a nicer husband, or if we have a better car or a better job, that our joy will be made full. But I'm here to tell you that you're setting yourself up for, for disappointments. Because what happens when your husband's not nice and when that fast car breaks down yeah. and when that better job stops paying you a paycheck? What happens then? That's a sandy foundation that is not built on our king. Jesus Christ is the rock. We need to make sure that our faith is built upon Him because He is our all-sufficient God. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Now you might say, well, if I could only be part of this Bible study, if I could only teach and get up there and preach, or if, if I could only be part of the worship team, or if I can only do this or do that, then my joy would be made full. No. <laughs> Not even those spiritual things are going to fulfill your joy. Fulfilling your joy is simply based on him, not on anything you can do for the Lord, not on anything the Lord can do for you, but simply on who he is. Wow, because he doesn't change. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His foundation doesn't shake. John the Baptist in verse 30, he says, what a radical response. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. Remember, the context of this is he's talking to his disciples. His disciples are like, hey, dude, Jesus is out here and he's baptizing and all the people are going to him. Multitudes are going to Jesus. What are you going to do about this? And John says, he must increase. I must decrease. He must grow in popularity. I must decrease in popularity. He must become more visible and I must become less visible. Because I am a servant. I am a slave. I am simply a voice. And a servant and a slave is not expected to be seen. They're just there to serve. And, and it's the master that gets all the attention. He must increase. I must decrease. And it's important for us to really absorb that. Because in our ministry, in our service, God's got to get the glory. He says in his words, says, Woe unto you shall you rob me of my glory. He must increase, and we must decrease. So pray and ask the Lord to help you lead lives and serve in a way that God always receives the glory. Even Jesus did that. With the most amazing things that he did, healing people, opening up blind eyes, opening up deaf ears. Somehow, some way, if you look at the responses of the people, afterwards they glorified God, they glorified the Father. He was able to do it in such a way that God... Setting an example for us to, that God would receive the glory. Now let's pick up in verse 31. Um, here, um, we're about to go to Theology 101. Theology 101. Uh, some Bible scholars believe, if you look at your Bible, depending on what version you have, you'll see some quotation marks that begin in verse 27 and they go to the end of the chapter 36. And... Your Bibles often uh, tend to give this section over to John the Baptist. Very well it could be. This could all be coming from the mouth of John the Baptist, but there are those scholars that believe that the quotation marks may end at the end of verse 30, and then the rest of it is picked up by John the Evangelist, not John the Baptist, John the writer of this gospel, and that he is simply expounding upon that which John the Baptist has thus declared. So we pick up, we don't know, John the Baptist, John the Evangelist, doesn't matter. We know it's God speaking behind it, so that's the important part. But in verse 31 it says, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from above is above all. It repeats it. Wow. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, 
and no one receives his testimony. It's very interesting. He's speaking of Jesus. He's speaking of the one that they said, hey, this guy's baptizing over there. And everybody's going to him. And John the Baptist, where his heart is at, when you're there in the will of God, in the simple will of God, your heart will be in a position where you take no credit, and apart from him you can do nothing, and you will begin to then exalt the king of kings and put him in his rightful place. And here... John says that, man, Jesus, man, he came from heaven. He's above all. He's not like any other man. He's not like me or, or, or one of these sinners down here. He's above all. He was earthly. Man, he speaks of the earth. But, but he who comes from a, a heaven, he who comes from heaven, man, he's more important. He's different. He's not the same as any of us. He's above all, exalting Jesus. And he says, and that which Jesus has seen and heard, he testifies, but no one receives his testimony. Interesting. That what Jesus has seen and heard? Fall back on the conversation with Nicodemus. Do you remember with Nicodemus when Jesus was speaking of, um, he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up? Why did he speak these things? Because he saw them. When Moses was there in the wilderness and he held up that serpent, Jesus was there. He was there. He was before all things. When he was making a reference to the wind and back to Ezekiel chapter 37 of when the bones, the dead bones that they joined together and you know, God breathed wind into them. Jesus was there. He was speaking things that, that he had seen and heard. He was before all things. Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, before Abraham was, I am making his declaration to be God. God was there. God took on flesh, John 1, 14. Came and dwelt among us. And it's so radical because John the Baptist is recognizing that. In verse 32 where he said that he has seen and heard and that he testifies. But no one receives his testimony. Wow. Why didn't they receive his testimony? When Jesus says, rejoice evermore in everything, give thanks, be holy, for I am holy. Do we receive that testimony? Or do we say, I can't rejoice evermore because I'm emotionally starved. I'm disturbed. I'm codependent. I come from a dysfunctional family. I will not receive his testimony. Jesus says, rejoice evermore. Be holy, for I am holy. You might say, Eric, I can't do that. I can't be holy. Well, you're right. Absorb the heart of John the Baptist, that apart from him you can do nothing. He will make you holy because of who he is. He is holy. And it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. Radical stuff. Verse 33, he who has received his testimony, the ones who do receive his testimony, has certified that God is true. He has certified and made a proclamation that God is true. Verse 34 says, He whom God has sent, Jesus, speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. And what John's speaking of here is the Old Testament prophets, when they spoke, they were limited by the Spirit of God, simply to what God had given them. Limited. But when Jesus came, every word that he spoke, he spoke the words of God. That the Spirit was without measure. That the Spirit was fulfilled. That He was the, the, uh, the fulfillment. <laughs> he, was, he was a fulfillment of the kingdom. The fulfillment of the Spirit. The exact representation of the Spirit. Completely Spirit-filled. And He spoke the words of God. In verse 35 it says, The Father loves the Son. And has given all things into his hand. And he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see la life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's interesting here. Note this, okay? That God simply doesn't want to give you eternal life. He wants to give you everlasting life. And everlasting life starts now. It doesn't just start when you die. It starts now. Everlasting life starts now. He came to give life and life abundantly. Apart from him, you can do nothing. 
It says some pretty crazy words there in the end. It says that the wrath of God is going to abide on those who don't believe. But why does the wrath of God be- uh, abide on those that do not believe in the Son? It's because those who do not believe in the Son have trampled on and stepped on and rejected the blood of the only begotten Son who came to die for them. And we know that the whole world is, is sinking fast. They're all in this, this, this bucket of quicksand. They're sinking. God doesn't condemn them for being in the quicksand. He doesn't condemn them for being lost or, or being stuck. He condemns them because when he holds out his nail-pierced hand and they do not receive it, they do not grab that nail-pierced hand for him to pull them out of that quicksand. It's to them. They are condemned and the wrath of God abides on them. He who comes from above, he's different. He who speaks the words of God is uniquely reliable in revelation because there is no error in the words that Jesus spoke. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. Life exists in the Son. I want to close with one thing, kind of encompassing in a nutshell, uh, chapter 3. I want you to note this if you're taking any notes. There's four times in chapter 3, as we close this chapter, four times in chapter 3 that the word must appears. Three things that must John chapter 3 is a must-read chapter because there are three or four prominent musts in this chapter. Number one, as we saw with Nicodemus, the sinners must, they must be born again. Chapter 3, verse 7. Sinners must be born again. The Savior must. The Savior must. In in chapter 3, verse 14, it says, So must the Son of Man be. Be lifted up. Chapter 3, verse 30. He must increase. Same verse. I must decrease. And I believe that if we will absorb those four musts into our life, that you won't just be a musty person, stinking the place up. (laughs) But you'll be a musty person, meaning I must abide in the will of God, the simple will of God. I must be born again. The Son of Man must be lifted up. I, he must increase. I must decrease. And God will begin to do something radical in your life. Your joy will be fulfilled. Take heed. To him who has an ear, let him hear. Do not let this word simply pass through. I shared with somebody recently, I said, God's word is, is like a seed, right? And when that seed is, goes into our ear, it should go down to our, ear, uh, down to our heart and, and, and plant itself in our heart and begin to grow. And if it's going to go out, the out, go out the other ear, if it goes in one ear and out the other ear, may it go into our heart first and begin to grow and come out like a vine that bears fruit out on the outside. And I just kind of got some stupid little picture in my mind, so... Uh, may you always remember that. Draw a little picture in your Bible of like the, the Word of God, the seed, going in one ear, planting in the heart, and coming out of the other ear in the shape of a branch that is abiding in Him. Come out of the mouth. Thank you. Well, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Thank you, Jesus. Sweet. Thanks for the correction there. Anyways, good word. You can always count on that guy sitting in the back back there to correct people. I love it. Sweet stuff. He did it with signal calls, too. Did you see him? Check this out. Let me, let me, share, let me share you a quick personal story, because that, that, that little signal call reminds me of something. I was driving down the road, and somebody was doing this with their hand. And they were yelling and screaming, and they were doing some obscenities. And they were doing this with their hand, this, this, this motion here. And then they were doing this. And they kept getting angry with me, and I'm thinking, what is their problem? You know what I mean? And... Uh, then it happened like the next day, and this, people are doing this to me, and I'm thinking, what, what is, what's up with that? And I told my wife, I said, these people are crazy. It's the oddest thing. Like, the two people keep doing this weird hand motion to me, and, and I started getting a little upset in my mind. I'm like, thinking, man, these people are stupid. What's their problem? Why are they flipping me off, and why are they, they screaming and yelling at me? I didn't do anything. I put my blinker on. 
when I changed lanes. Later, I found out like a month later that my, my tail light was out. And when I was turning my blinker on, <laughs> it wasn't working. So the people were like, put your blinker on. They do the hand signal. I got humbled real quick. You know what I mean? It was my fault. Anyhow, I don't know why I shared that with you. But bless God. Hope you guys are hearing me today. I know we uh, just cruising through the word. Will it change us? I hope so. I hope it will change us because it's not, it does no good to, to know it. We've got to be doers of the word. And we can't do it on our own. God's got to do it. He's our sufficiency. So let's cry out to the Lord even now and say, God, apart from you, we're nothing. Apart from you, we can't live godly. Apart from you, Lord, we can't do anything. Let's cry out. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much, God, for being our sufficiency for being our all-sufficient God. And I pray, Father, for every need that anybody has in here. Maybe it's a practical need. They have a specific need. And I ask, Father, that you would just begin to work in their hearts that, that you come before that need. That all the promises of God are given in you. You're the substance. All we truly need is you. And, and as we embrace you, Lord, all these other things follow. Because, Lord, if we seek ye first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added unto us, Lord. I pray that you remind us of these things. And, Lord, I pray that, that your love and your compassion and your grace would so overwhelm each individual in here today, myself included, Lord. Overwhelm us by your spirit and by your grace. Lord, that we could just have a natural response, just naturally want to serve you because you've been so good to us. And anybody, Lord, that's struggling with the will of God, knowing your will, Lord, teach them, Lord, that it's just, it's just so simple. It's simple. Just abide in you, Lord. Lord, that you'll put these desires in their heart. Give them the strength just to go and just to do whatever you've called them to do. We thank you so much, God. Yielding to all you demand. Pray this in Jesus' name. And I surrender to your will and your plan. Just to know you more is everything, everything I've ever wanted to know.